Um, well, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I've only learned two Slovenian words, so hvala for coming. Um, Dobro being the other one, so those are good words to know. Uh, it, it's pretty exciting for me because Yanis out of nowhere kind of said, I'd like to show works and, of yours. And I said, sure, and he picked these four works and I thought he really has a good eye for understanding uh, the, the differences and the similarities with the projects. So what I wanted to do is start with a question move through some, a series of questions that I ask and I think about, and then show some of the work, the projects in here and some related projects that are not in the, in the space. But uh, as always, I must self-promote and say you can always find more work of mine online uh, and follow me on Twitter, of course, because that's what everyone has to say now. But on to the question. So why is it that the word virtual is usually said in the same way as the word digital? I think that some of it may have to do with virtual reality, that that was a word, a term that was coined in the early 1990s uh, when you had things like this. This is a virtual reality sphere. Um, it looks like a human hamster uh, running through this ball. Um, but in the early 1990s, there were these new visions of digitally driven immersive experiences, right, in popular culture. You have Max Headroom from 1985 and Lawnmower Man from 1992. And then you, you also have this. Yes, that's right. So uh, th this is Star Trek's holodeck, right? What is it? It's this magic black box that could instantly manifest highly realistic interactive illusions. Okay? Uh, fantasy, also from the late 80s. Uh, but we don't have that yet. Uh, we do have this. Um, this is the Oculus Rift. Uh, a crowdfunded virtual reality device that you know, virtual reality is such a strong desire that some Harvard dropout spent two billion dollars to ruin it. I mean, I'm sorry, acquire it. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, as he says, deal with it. Um, you know, but the thing about this device is that when you talk about virtual reality, it's a very strange name for what it is because it sacrifices reality in the service of the virtual, because for it to work, it actually has to block out reality for it to work, okay? It's reality deprivation, if anything. And that's why if you see videos of people using Oculus Rift for the first time, they're hilarious. No! 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 I don't want to play it! No! I don't want to play it! No! Right? So why, why is that so funny? Uh, because you know, virtual reality is so incompatible with real reality that profound dissonance between visual and physical input causes this imbalance and coordination in the real world. Okay? So, so virtual reality isn't what we talk about when we're talking about virtual. What is virtual? So it's a very old word. Uh, in English, it comes from as, as early as the 1400s. And you can see that it says, as opposed to physical, or although not in form or actuality. And then a similar word in English, the adverb virtually, it means nearly, almost, as good as, right? It's virtually perfect. It means it's almost perfect. Which means that the word virtual really means physical-like, or real-ish. And it's that ish that's really the interesting part. Because virtuality is not the exclusive domain of computers. Okay? Being virtual, being real ish, goes back to our earliest times. Because being virtual is about the precise representation and manipulation of our world, of our reality. And that need and the ability to approximate, to simulate, and to virtualize, this has a long history. So let's consider a different framework for how to think about the word virtual, okay? So this is a diagram that I use to kind of frame it. So for thousands of years, it was virtual and real, right? There were the things that were real and then the things that were almost real. And in the last 50 years, we've now included this new extra paradigm, analog and digital, right? How it's produced and whether or not it's real or virtual. And it suggests that there's rarely exclusivity to any one state. There's a bit of virtuality around us at all times. And reality can mix with the virtual world and back and forth. So case in point, this is an image that I took in Dubai about five years ago. And you can imagine this could have been seen by anyone 5,000 years ago in the desert. What you have is a tree growing up in a courtyard. The canvas stretches across. The tree goes through the canvas. And you don't see the tree. 
but you see its completion in a virtual version of itself thanks to the sun casting a shadow. Right? A 2D image made automatically by a three-dimensional object meets a three-dimensional object of itself. You walk down the street, the shadow that's cast on the sidewalk, that is a virtual image of yourself. Right? It's an accurate simulation, it's two-dimensional, and is done automatically. Okay? So, but maybe you don't want to take my word for it. Let's go back in time and see some other examples. So the origin of painting. So who invented painting? I mean, is there anyone that we can say is the inventor of painting? It seems really crazy to ask that. But there is a story that tells the actual history of painting. And so Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman historian during ancient Roman days, he died in Pompeii. He wrote this massive, multi-volumed uh, history of the natural world. And in it, there's a section he talks about art and he talks about painting. And that the story of painting comes from a woman in love with a man about to go on a long journey. So she traced the profile of his face as thrown upon the wall by the light of the lamp. Okay? And it looks something a little bit like this. Uh, this is the frontispiece for the art of painting by Charles Alphonse Dufresnois, 1716. Uh, you see here there's the light, there's the, the profile of the person, the shadow that's cast, and the tracing of the shadow. And sometimes the angels are there to help. Now, during the late 18th and early 19th century, the origin of painting was a common theme for artists, as tales from antiquities received renewed attention by neoclassical artists. Right? Here's the latest one from 1830. Now, beyond painting, you also found it in other things around the same time. These are business cards for art teachers from 1800. Okay, so there's origin of painting, origin of painting, and as you see, like etching and engraving taught by C. Phillips, uh, or the prices for different courses you can take, and also print dealers, so people in the commercial business of art. A print seller uh, also had business cards using this. And beyond the 18th century, this was also kind of something for artists to think about art in the 20th century. So you have the satirical artist Komar and Melamed. Uh, this is called The Origin of Socialist Realism. Uh, from <laughs> from 1984, uh, Stalin, right? Uh, you have then contemporary work, uh, photographer uh, Karen Knorr, 1994, uh, and uh, French artist Francine Hove uh, from 2007. Now, Pliny gives us this story of painting, according to him, but the description, this narrative that he gives, has little to do with paint, right? It's really an origin of virtuality, because the precise concrete memory, that almost person, captured in that memory, is that virtual moment. Okay? The shadow projection is the how, that's how she did it, but the paradigm, the framework, the conceptual framework around it is virtuality. Okay? And it's not just the domain of art, because we can look at science as well in the history of mathematics, because shadows are also practical. So shifting to even older times, uh, here we have the Pyramid of Giza, 2500 BC, so we're talking nearly 5,000 years ago. Now, 2,000 years later, than the construction of this. Egyptians were gone, the Greeks were there, and they had a simple question. How tall is this? Very hard to measure if you think about what it must have been like around 6th century BC. Now Thales of Miletus, who is the father of science and one of the first true mathematicians, had this very simple idea because he saw that there's a shadow that's cast by the, by the pyramid and if you set up a very simple experiment, you have the pyramid cast a shadow and if you just have a stick of a height that you know, uh, you use similar triangles to calculate the height of the pyramid. Brilliant, right? Now, one of his students, uh, Anaximander, who was the teacher of Pythagoras, uh, brought the gnomon to Greece. The gnomon is the stick that casts a shadow in a sundial, okay? Now, beyond time, he was able to figure out something very essential about our world because he noticed that the sh length of the shadow at noon is different in the summer than in the winter. And so he's able to create a diagram of the known universe using a sundial. Because he noticed that the sun is higher in the sky in the summer, so the sun must be doing this because it circles the earth, of course. And then in the winter, it's down lower and that causes a different shadow. And so he's able to virtualize an image of the world without leaving the planet by just using a sundial. And another experiment, Eratosthenes in third century BC, figured out the circumference of the earth using shadows. Okay? So there, on the equator, there's a well, a hole in the ground, that he knows that on a certain day at noon, the sun shines and there's no shadow. Okay? So it's directly overhead. 
uh, several miles away, there's an obelisk in a town that when the sun casts a shadow at the same time, there's a shadow of a known length. So he can use the difference between the two to come up with an arc length and angle reference, multiply it to 360 degrees, and he came up with a number for the circumference of the Earth, and he was within 2% error. And if he had known that the Earth was more like a tomato, a little flat at the top, he would have been even closer. So there's something fascinating about these ancient Greeks using it because then it wasn't long before the shadows became something more. Because you can't control the sun, but you can make a parallel to what you see by turning light rays into vectors or lines in space that you can draw. This is the artist Fred Sandback from the 1970s, an actual piece of string in space. But if you look at uh, Ptolemy and the Geographia in around 120 AD, he comes up with several different methods for flattening the Earth using lines that you draw on paper. Because trying to take the curvature of the Earth and flatten it for maps is a, a, a trick to try to understand this complex dimension. And so he, he builds these projection methods uh, in the first century AD. Because it takes this virtual construction system to turn this into this. Okay? Now, moving on. Perspective. Because in the early Renaissance, artists discovered Ptolemy's text and said, interesting. Ptolemy can take this round thing and flatten it. What could we use it for? Filippo Brunelleschi comes up with a method for perspective. And he does it using very similar methods, vectors in space with a picture plane. And when the lines hit the picture plane, they give you coordinates for an image that looks like life. And his famous experiment was he stood in front of uh, the baptistry in Il Duomo in Florence. And he stands there with someone else and he shows them the painting. The painting is actually painted on the outside with a hole drilled in the vanishing point. And you stare at the real building over here and you put a mirror here to see the painting on this side. When you move the mirror away, the image does not change because the painting was so perfect. And this was his way of demonstrating perspective. Now his good friends, Alberti and Piero della Francesca, all came up with their own versions of perspective using lines in space to generate very realistic imagery. In fact, Masaccio in the Holy Trinity and Santa Maria Novella created one of the first perspective images, a fresco so accurate in perspective that five centuries later, it's easy to reverse engineer a flat painting into a three-dimensional space because it all works in perspective. And you also then have Paolo Uccello, these kind of amazing drawings that are points in space calculated and then connected using something that we would now call wireframe. And by 1500, this is all very standard practice, translating the 3D world into 2D images using vectors, intersecting a picture plane, very standard practice, as you can see with Raphael in the School of Athens and the Vatican, 1511. And so you have to start to think, well, maybe the world is actually flat because we have this, <laughs> and, and we have this. This is my favorite, not because I prefer Microsoft, but they call it the, this is the surface, the Microsoft surface. They're telling you it's flat. And the way that we look at the world has had this history of being flat, and the way that now that we engage with the world is flat. This is my daughter who recognizes not only an image of herself, but goes to touch immediately because she wants to engage with that flat plane. But this whole screenification of reality has a long history because we think about 150 years of, of modern media. Photography, this is flat. This is Louis Daguerre's 1838 first photo. But then you also think of cinema in 1896, Thomas Edison's first projection system for a theater. In fact, I look at you and I look at this and it's the same thing 100 years later. You also then have television and then computers. This is one of the first modern computers, Xerox Alto 1973. Uh, it has a mouse. Th these are your disks. <laughs> and there's your hard drive. Um, a vertical screen, perfect for selfies, you know, because you look vertically. Um, but it's not just technology, because this also goes far back. We think about the camera obscura effect, the fact that a projection can happen naturally without anyone doing anything technological. Or you think about uh, specular surfaces, reflections, right? Here's Narcissus in his selfie, uh, as painted by Caravaggio 1599. Right? We're flattening the world through all of this media. These are all virtual images uh, of real life. Now, a quick digression because I'm trained as an architect. Um, I, spent, uh, two I got two degrees in architecture and I spent many years as an architect. And architecture is a very curious field. Any architects here? Anyone ever trained as an architect? There you go. So you're going to know what I'm talking about. So what does an architect do? Do we build buildings? No, we don't. 
Because what do we do? We draw buildings for others to build. And that we have to precisely draw a building as though it is complete to instruct others in building. Okay? So this takes a kind of amazing skill in virtuality because the real comes after the virtual. You compare the real building to the virtual model, the drawings and stuff that you created to see if it's correct. It's a very curious backwards process. Um, and that takes some certain kind of virtuality. And it's a very old set of systems. So these are plans through a building um, from, what is this, from almost 2000 BC. And a plan is a slice through a building parallel to the ground and projected towards a picture plane with parallel lines. It's not a view. It's a vision system that architects use to, to communicate information. And so you have these two different paradigms. You have the cube that's the perspective on the left and on the right where the lines are parallel and measurable, very useful for architects. So if we go back to the origin of painting, here's one made by Carl Friedrich Schinkel, who was an architect uh, in Germany in 1830. And you notice that what he does is he uses the sun as the source of imagery. And by using the sun, the consequence is this, that the shadow and the original profile are exactly the same size because the sun's rays are parallel, so you have one-to-one -one measurable image. And that is an architect thinking, because the parallel projection is what's useful here. And so you couldn't have, let's say, maps and plans without this kind of architectural thinking. This is the Noli plan of Rome. Uh, or this relationship between multiple two-dimensional views. So you have two different projections. In one case, St. Peter's in plan, and then St. Peter's in section. And what you're doing as an architect is you're describing a 3D world two dimensions at a time. You have this image, and then you have this one that meets it, and then together it kind of describes three-dimensional worlds. And here's a simpler version of that. This is a diagram trying to explain the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Okay, so in, from above, if you looked at this and this, you'd say, well, the first bullet, the second bullet, the third bullet, but from the side, you see that one bullet's coming from high up, the other two bullets are coming from low. So something is not happening correctly. This line in space is different than the other lines in space. And that's an incredible, powerful suggestion that one can virtualize three-dimensional space in two dimensions. And then years and centuries of convention yield these hybrid models of drawing. Again, St. Peter's, where you can kind of slice through it, see vertical surfaces and horizontal surfaces at the same time. You have Elisitsky prown space. This is called isometry, where you're making isometric images. Or more complex versions, like stereotomy, in which you unfold these complex shapes of stones that you would use to build your Gothic cathedral, and you lay that paper on top of a stone to carve it so it fits perfectly when you, when you assemble your building. Or what could basically be the first computational graphic system, Gaspard Monge, French uh, designer of 1765, with descriptive geometry. The ability to take a series of, of solids, of platonic solids, and then rotate them and move them around. Here you have conic sections, so you can extract circles, hyperbole, ellipses, etc., from one thing. And so this is a really fascinating history that as an architect, you're actually moving these systems around in measurable ways to imagine a three-dimensional thing, but never seeing a three-dimensional thing until the very end. Okay? Now, you may ask, yeah, but computers, right? They do everything better because they're machines. They're not actually figuring these things out. This is Ivan Sutherland's sketch pad, 1963. He's using a light pen to draw um, at MIT. It's, it's an amazing machine. But this is not the first time we talk about drawing machines. Right? So what is a drawing machine? Yeah, that's, that's a drawing machine, sure. It's beautiful. This is uh, Robert Hauser, uh drawing apparatus from 2012. But let's go back for a second. So the very first time that perspective was described, Brunelleschi never published it, Alberti did, in Della Pittura. This is on painting. At the very end, after pages and pages of mathematical explanation of what perspective is, he says, well, OK, I know it's hard. But I have an idea for you. You can take a veil, a, velo, it's a piece of thin fabric, and you can place it between the eye and the thing seen so that the visual pyramid penetrates through the thinness of the veil. And then you can copy what you see. Because, as he says, for it is easier to copy painting than sculpture. Turning something three-dimensional to two-dimensional is a lot harder 
than copying a two-dimensional thing to a two-dimensional thing. So what might that have looked like? Uh, probably something like this, Albrecht Dürer, uh, 1525. We've seen this image before, I'm sure, in our history classes. The, the, this, the grid here is the grid here, and so when you look through, you say, okay, the nose is at this corner, and I can use that to help translate what I see. But for millennia, we've been making machines. So you have other versions, Albrecht Dürer again, so now a string helping organize your lines of sight, or much more sophisticated drawing machines, perspective compasses by George Adam, 1803. And then you even have toys, the Wondergraph, which is the great-grandfather of the Spirograph, which creates these beautiful little roulette geometries like hypotrochoids. Um, fun, but also visualizing the invisible. Plotters are old. Pantograph from 1608. This is Diderot's encyclopedia version where you copy an image by tracing it and then the arms automatically draw the copy. You change the ratio of the arms, you get enlargements, reductions, or exact copies. You can get more sophisticated than that, like Johann Heinrich Lambert, 1752. You trace the plan of your garden and it draws the perspective automatically. Okay? And then you have even more sophisticated, you go into the 19th century, Florent de Villepigue, a uh, French surveyor, a device that you drag across a countryside, and as the machine starts to move, it draws the contours on the drum to, to create a map of your path automatically. Or you have, in the 20th century, thanks to photography, aerial stereo photographs entered into this machine, a stereo isohypsograph by the gentleman at Zeiss, where you trace the, the, the photos and it creates a map for you automatically. Or you have things that would draw people with great likeness. Jules Louis Chrétien, 1783, the Physiana Trace, which launched the silhouette craze of the late 18th century. You stand here and you basically trace the person's profile and it becomes this profile that you can use. Or optical effects like uh, Camera Obscura, a box that has a pinhole, it projects an image, in this case, uh, Athanasius Curator's version from 1646, a veil in here, so you are not in a box, you're in a box within a box with a projected image that you can trace from the other side. Or, of course, then the camera lucida invented in 1807, a prism in which when you look down into the prism, you see your hand and the image of your subject at the same time so you can trace it from light. Okay? So, that's the way of thinking that, that I want to introduce, but now I want to talk a little bit about work. What do I do with all that information? Um, illusions are a really big part of, of my work that I, I really happen to love. My favorite illusion ever uh, must, must be this one. This is Hans Holbein's The Ambassadors from 1533. Anyone seen it in person in London? I highly recommend it. It is one of the most fantastically painted paintings you'll ever see. The detail in the fabric and all of this is fantastic. And then on top of that, he adds this very curious shape in front, right, down below. Now, if you stand where I am standing now compared to the painting, you see this view. And you start to realize that the image is, in fact, an oblique image corrected when you look at it from the original oblique vantage point. And this is called anamorphosis. And you can do this very simply if you know how to, let's say, construct perspective, because instead of projecting your perspective onto a flat plane, you turn the plane sideways, and as it projects, a circle you draw can look like an ellipse, but from the original point, it looks like a circle again. Very simple. And I've been fascinated not only with anamorphosis as an illusion for a long time, but also Holbein's skulls. Uh, so for a while, I kind of was using a skull and imagining other anamorphic moments. So a tattoo, that when you point at someone, it reminds them, thou art mortal. I would have done a real tattoo, but tattoo artists suggested I don't do it because this would turn into a big black blob within a few years. It's a bad place to put a tattoo. Uh, so I made temporary ones, uh, a limited edition version. Uh, his and her sizes, black for high contrast and pink for very subtle. So maybe you're pointing at someone, they don't exactly know why they're sensing mortality <laughs> at that moment. I've also made other kinds of things, very everyday objects, t-shirts, so there's Holbein's skull once again in a near-far shirt where up close it's a bunch of dots at a certain distance, you see it there. I also anamorphosis, uh, these are shirts in which everyone except you knows what you're wearing on a t-shirt. <laughs> So this is the opposite. This is a shirt in which no one knows what you're wearing, but when you look down, you see what it is. And in this case, images that you wouldn't normally wear in public. So a nude woman as you look down. So you would all see me, I'd be looking at a naked lady. Right? And then so uh, this was a whole series called Vantage Tees, different colors, different images, etc. 
I was then asked uh, to do an installation at the Mattress Factory Art Museum in Pittsburgh, USA. And they gave me this room, which was this 19th century room that was painted all white and only had one door. And so I said, well, the, the windows are really impressive. They're big, they're, they're huge, and then they're all kind of removed of detail. And so I said, well, if you come in the room, what would it look like if you looked over towards the corner and you saw there was an extra window? And so it looked something like this. Uh, the, the one window is here, another here, and then I pan painted the detail on one, and then I made the illusion on the wall next to it. And it looked something like this when you walked around the room. So because the room is all white, you actually don't realize that there's no depth. And as you start to move, the wall seems to turn on you because the, your eye is trying to negotiate two different viewpoints at once. And so as you walk around the room, you see that. And because there's only one door, when you exit and if you look back, the room resets itself uh, back to the original position. And there's a kind of curious geometry to this because you see uh, as you try to negotiate all the different shapes, it has to look perfect from one point of view. Now, Historically, there have been other ways to create these illusions. Uh, so this is a katoptric, uh, coming from the Greek for mirror, uh, illusion. And at one time in the, in the 1600s and 1700s, this was a very powerful way to hide messages. Because not everybody had something like this, a perfectly mirrored cylinder. So you could create this message here that would be unknown. Maybe you're trying to overthrow the duke, or you're trying to say something against the church. You would hide it, and this would be a way to hide messages. And so I made my own out of Holbein skull. Uh, very simple nowadays, laser cut plastic with a sticker that I have printed online. Uh, you have to do the geometry on, on your computer, but that's not that hard once you find these old books. Now the curious thing is that we actually have these chrome mirrored cylinders everywhere now. Because you can, put, you can take one of these and then basically you know, go somewhere, find a mirror, and then and, and just leave it there. Like at a urinal, for example. Or maybe you work in a chemistry lab. Or in a school, in just a, very, a, a table, uh, just in a classroom. Maybe a piece of dangerous equipment. Or, I know it's cruel, but in a hospital, uh, at the wheelchair, or in a doctor's office. Um, and for, for this show, we've installed a urinal uh, with some reference to Duchamp. Uh, it's kind of nice to be compared. Uh, but we also produced, I produced a series that are exactly the diameter of your uh, bicycle uh, stands around uh, Ljubljana. And so uh, we, we made a custom edition of 20 or 25, I can't remember how many we have. Uh, and we welcome you to take it and try it out because I went around Ljubljana to, to do it myself. Um, and you can just leave them there. So it's just a little rubber band and you just kind of hook it around and hold it there. And you may have to look, balance it to find the image, but it's there. Now it works best with chrome, very, very polished, not stainless steel. But you'll find a bunch around. I was actually surprised how easy it was to find. Um, so that's Memento Mori here. Now, I also work not just in the past, but also in the present. Virtual is still also digitally related. And um, I, I collaborate with people that I sometimes don't get to meet in person. And so for the last year and a half, I've worked with Addy Wagonect, who is in FAT. She lives in Innsbruck. I live in Chicago. And we live by working each with each other online. This is us waiting for each other to get on Skype. Um, and so we, we've been fascinated about like internet culture and like what it is to work with people when you meet in digital spaces. And so we started to think, well, what is the most interesting digital space to meet? Where do people kind of engage the most amazing digital interactions? And so of course, we went to sex cams. How many of you have been to a sex cam before? Of course, you won't admit it. <laughs> so what is a sex cam? You people don't even know what it is. You're like, oh, I, we're so, we're, we're so, we're so uh, pleasant here in Ljubljana. We don't know what these things are. So a web, uh, this is basic, a, a basic sex cam setup. It's a website in which people will broadcast themselves uh, through the site live. Uh, and people can tech, type in a chat to say compliments or ask them to do sexual acts. And then there's a money system built into it as well, where you use your credit card to buy tokens, and you tip the performer for certain acts. 
and they say, you know, it's 20 tokens to do this, 40 tokens to do that, and it's, it's a whole kind of uh, uh, interactive culture. And it really is for everybody. You have men and women, gay and straight, old, young, couples, transgendered, everything. It's really kind of an amazing world. Um, but one day, we were kind of looking in this space, trying to figure out what is this all about. We noticed this image. Right? This is a typical image because what happens is these are unedited, these aren't videos. It's someone sitting in their house waiting for someone maybe to say, hey, show, show me your tits, take off your shirt, do something for me. So they sit there and wait. And I said, but, huh, this woman looks strangely familiar in a weird way. So we tried something. And then we did this for about a month. So the project was called Webcam Venus, and it's about a lot of things. It's about notions of beauty and social cultural context for beauty. Uh, it's connecting contemporary digital imagery with historical virtual images, right? Paintings are these kinds of virtual images. And uh, it's, it's this kind of curious question in which, you know, it, which one is, if, if this one's pornography, then so is this one. If this one is beautiful, then so is that one. And so we, we have not only in this show the full video that you just saw with more uh, sex cam stuff, but we also have one example of watching the performers try to get into the, the proper pose um, for it. But um, it's, it's, it's an amazing, this is, she, he, she is my absolute favorite. I mean, not only does he, she look like it, but if you see the performance, tries very hard to get that pose just right. Now, as a secondary project to this, we created another project because we noticed that in addition to performers doing things, there's a lot of time in which they just walk away, go to the bathroom, get a sandwich, and then the, the camera's just going for no reason. And so, so we started to collect a lot of this and think, huh, it's really curious. There are all these weird little video clips of just like nothing, but not nothing, like interiors. These are people's actual homes around the world. And so we, we created a project where we wrote some code to capture images of live webcams when the performer is not there and then put them together in a site. Uh, so if you go to brbxoxo.com, you'll see these things automatically refresh with images where the performers are not there. Uh, brbxoxo is internet speak for be right back, kisses and hugs, <laughs> right? So you can go on there and it just constantly cycles through all these images. And uh, it had a fun thing because people were like online saying things like not only well, I don't get this, but then immediately someone was saying, oh, you know there's someone masturbating to this somewhere uh, because that's what the internet is like. Everyone is into something, right? So I want to kind of go through drawing a little bit uh, to kind of, this is the pre-conclusion. So uh, this is Albrecht Dürer once again. 
And this is from his four books on human proportion from 1528. And I thought how beautiful it is that he's trying to work out these kind of systems for understanding what humans are like. But I thought, wow, what would Durer have done with a computer? Because you can take that information and as I did, start to extrapolate many more images from him. And once you take that information out, you can do a lot with it. So we've set it up here in the show uh, with the little video next to it so you can see about it with a, a spotlight coming across the room uh, and you can watch that shadow happening live. Now um, this piece was uh, a set of, there's two pieces that, that I was kind of working through with this and I call it a profilograph, a, a drawing made through profiles. But there was other kinds of profile data that was fascinating because what about time-based profile data? So if you have something like Edward Muybridge's Animal Locomotion series from the 1870s, you have individual frames, side view of this running horse. And I thought, you could do the same thing that you did with Durer that you do with this. So tracing the 12 original frames, you can extract new information from there, eventually making it a solid so that once you slice through, you're essentially not only generating a, an accurate animation, but you're actually generating more frames than the original 12 frame movie. Right, so every so often there's one frame, but if you animate the original, you get a really nice kind of stuttering image, but mine, much more fluid. Not that it's better, it's just more fluid. Um, and so there's a series of drawings that go along with this, kind of generating that, but what's fascinating is once you have a digital model of it, you can look around it. So this is the underside of a horse running over time. And then inventing a process with some very smart people, coming up with a way like, how do you get it out of the computer? Because that's the part that always seems to be frustrating. Like you make a beautiful thing in the computer, what do you do with it? Well, so in 2007, it was still a new art, but we used 3D printing to print it in starch. Okay, so a starch printer is actually compressed powder, and we dipped it in wax, and then used it in investment casting for making bronze. So the wax originals are actually encased uh, in the plaster and then poured bronze, broken, and then TIG welded together. So you end up with a bronze version of the horse. Uh, it's a physical, real, real thing that came almost straight out of the computer. We couldn't afford the shipping for this heavy bronze thing, so you know, we, it's not here, but that's fine. Now drawing machines, as you already saw, are a beautiful thing. Uh, and I used to make my own drawing machines. This is one that I made in graduate school, where you look through here uh, at your subject and then you move the, the tubes around uh, and then you can trace it onto the drum. That's a much younger version of me doing it. Uh, but it draws directly on here and then when you unroll you can flatten out the image and see. And so I spend a lot of time like really interested in drawing machines and then on top of it also being really interested in studying real drawing machines. And so here is uh, uh, Ludovico Cigoli's uh, 1600 drawing machine and then a replica at the University of Modena and I went there and kind of got first-hand experience because it's more than just this one image. The way it works is really fascinating. And it led to, the research led to a project um, called Machine Drawing Drawing Machines because I said, well, I have a machine I can work with. It's called a CNC. You tell it where to go and it does what you want. Usually doing it with a drill to cut something, but I can just add a pen. Why not? And so I made this. So it, 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 that was a time lapse, obviously, but it draws all these, these drawing machines. Uh, and you, you can see here, and it's on a nice piece of artist paper, and it even writes a little text on the bottom so you know what it is. And then the details of it are kind of this curious artifact of the computer and you know, the, the geometry that it uses to help figure out where to draw. And then there's a frontispiece, uh, machine drawing drawing machines, in which 12 drawings of historical drawing machines are drawn by a computer numerical control machine, <laughs> and a self-portrait as drawn uh, by itself. Now, 
I'm also working on a lot of other things with drawing machines. There's a website I'm building called drawingmachines.org in which anyone can find any drawing machine in history. Uh, I have about 500 different drawing machines, and you'll be able to learn about it by going to the website. Um, that should be launching soon. If you go now, there's a splash page. But um, very good research tool because I went through a lot of struggle to find a lot of these things. There's no reason you should. So if you're into drawing machines, look out for that. You can even follow us at, at drawing machines on Twitter. Anyway, so moving on. So. Speaking of drawing machines, David Hockney, the British artist, wrote a book about 15 years ago. And in it, he proposed, I think that the great masters of art may have used tools to draw and paint. That they're not magical superhuman beings, but rather they may have used certain things. Things like mirrors and lenses and things to help them make their images. Maybe you've heard about also more recently a film called Tim's Vermeer, where someone carefully reconstructs Vermeer paintings to draw them um, as they would have. And so uh, he suggested, for example, that Jean Auguste Dominique Ang in the 1817, 18, 18 period, doing these drawings, may have used a camera lucida. And here is David Hockney using his camera lucida. And again, it's a simple device, one that doesn't take very long to learn how to use, and then you just work on it. And if you're talented like Ang, then maybe you can do this. And so the problem with the book is that he talks about it as an artist, not a historian. He says, I got one of these camera lucidas and I tried it. And I said, this is incredible. I can see how Ang might have done this. But there was such controversy because art historians and curators didn't want to believe that the old masters may have been cheating, because that's what they were saying. And so Hockney's book came under fire. But I thought, well, what if I just get a camera lucida and try it? Uh, and so I started collecting some from eBay uh, and various places and realizing that there's different kinds of designs and different reasons they work differently. Uh, this is my first one that I bought and I used to take it with me traveling uh, and doing these drawings. So this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, glaciers in Norway or still life objects. So um, these are b hotel beds after I sleep in them. Uh, and you know you can get an enormous amount of detail and because of the machine you can set it up every day in the same exact spot and create aligned images. These are four different days. Um, so we started thinking that you know as two art professors what would happen if you could take this device and give it to students? Golan Levin and I, that's him there, he couldn't be with us but he, so he's here virtually and you can see how it works. It's this very beautiful simple little instrument and what if we could actually change the conversation and say, OK, forget about whether or not Hockney was right. Why don't you just use one of the tools and you tell us? Decide for yourself. Is this something that could have been used? Is it easy? Is it cheating? Who knows? Um, and so we can talk, get away from superhuman ability and talk more about art and technology, because honestly, that's what we've, we've always done. Now, the problem is that these are expensive. And they're antiques. They're priced as antiques, and so no one's going to buy them, especially our students who don't have money. And they're not going to use it as a tool. But we thought, well, really all we need to do to make our own is make a prism, because we happen to own some old ones. You can take it apart, figure out how the prism works, get some prisms made. And so you know, that's the magic right there. The rest is just a design object. Um, that's not that bad. And so we came up with this uh, uh, CNC aluminum uh, peat holder with then these off-the-shelf parts that you also just clamp to your table. Uh, you put your paper down there and you draw. Works the same as, as uh, an old one, right? You take your object, you put it in front, right? And you look straight down into the prism. Straight down is very important. And you can see the ghost image and you trace it. Pretty nice, right? Simple setup. If you do portraits, the person sitting has to stay very, very still, or you're going to end up cross-eyed, I promise you. This happens a lot. Um, and so it was this nice idea, because we're like, look at all these parts. There's like 75 parts in an old one, and ours maybe was six or seven parts. Very easy. And so we said, this is a great thing. We made it, and we, then we called it the Neo Lucida, a new Lucida, new camera Lucida. And it was a little expensive, though, because what happened was we said, this is what the prism has to be. We went to manufacturers and said, well, can you make us some prisms? And they said, OK, but we have to make 500 minimum. And we said, OK, that's a little too much money for us. So we went to a crowdfunding site, uh, Kickstarter. And so the goal, if you're not familiar, Kickstarter is a crowdfunding place where you propose a project. And then people can decide, oh, I want to give you $30 or $40 to help you with your project. In return, they get a reward. Usually in this case, they would get one of our devices. And so there was this kind of like, well, 
you know, it's an experiment, right? Maybe it's a provocation. It's a, a thing like, what if we could do this in the world? I mean, how many people would actually want a tool that they'd never even heard of, right? This happened in 72 hours. And so it was an incredible moment in which a lot of people really responded. And we, we stopped the number because we got scared because we were gonna make 500 in, you know, get some students, get some pizza. In a weekend, we'd all just build it together with parts that we get from China. But now we're like, oh my, 11,000? That's not pizza anymore, that's something else. And so we went back to the drawing board, we redesigned it, uh, it's, it's a slimmer, better product, it's, it's now custom made uh, with our fancy logo inside the clamp. Uh, we were making it all black, because everyone loves that. Uh, all slick. We also then made it ambidextrous. You could turn it around so if you're left-handed, uh, it doesn't get in the way. So that's nice because my wife is left-handed and she was upset. Uh, so this is, this is good. And then we went to China. There's, there, there I am with Golan. They gave us quality control hats to wear as we went around and kind of did our quality control check of the prisms and such. We came up with all these, these processes for making and, and assembling all these and they got to making about a thousand a day. Uh, assembling by hand, a small group of people. We, d we joined them for a while. And then we even ended up making really nice packaging. Look, it looks like Apple product, very nice. Um, and, and then we shipped them out. We made 11,000 for the people on Kickstarter. We made an additional uh, 4,000 that we sold on Amazon and those sold out in three weeks. So we're sold out, but we made 15,000 and now we're making more because people keep asking for it. It's great. Uh, 67 countries and we did it from the moment of the Kickstarter to the delivery of the first was five months. Amazing. Uh, it's the global world, you know, you can get anything you want. But for us, there's also other fascinating side. Because I teach 75 students a year. This is a way bigger audience who's now listening to me. This is, this is I mean, I have 700 Twitter followers, right? And this is crazy. And we said, this is a really important thing, because now you're going to have this new media art pose everywhere, right? Like, you know, people like in this pose, like there's gonna be a whole community of people doing this. So we said we owe them something. This is more than just a, a product. And so some of the things that we did was it's open source. So we're producing open source documents so everyone can learn how to do them. We've also sold some prisms by themselves and then offer a free download of 3D printed files so you can print your own prism holder. Maybe you want to customize what it's attached to. Uh, so in this case, a standard nut that goes to a tripod. So any kind of magic arm or something you can use. But in addition, we got a lot of questions. I want one of this, but wait, what is it? What's a camera lucida? I mean, I love what you're telling me I can do with it, but what is it? So we started to write essays in Kickstarter for our backers about the history of the tool. So this is kind of this learning environment for 11,000 people. And so what, what was really funny was that the Neo Lucida is just this prism on a stick, but the project actually was so much more because it's crowdfunded, it's crowd learning, a massive open online course, it's crowd empowering because we're saying to you, here's how it works. Go do something with that. Learn what to do with it. And then a laboratory because people are now using it and telling us what they're using it for. Stuff that we couldn't have imagined. We're artists. But we had scientists say we're using it in our botany class to draw flowers. Where I'm a medical professor and I, I love having students draw anatomy from life. I thought this is really interesting. So we did all these workshops and we're kind of seeing what people do. Um, here's a live, live drawing class with a live model. And the model said, my, my job is usually to be stared at by people. And I was really weirded out by having no one looking at me. <laughs> right? I mean, they are looking at her, but they're not looking at her. They're looking at her virtual image on their page. And then seeing some, so this is one of my students who's using it with the Wacom tablet or with the paper app on iPad with the stylus, et cetera. And then there's this whole community that's building up around it on Twitter and Instagram, people posting drawings and then comments like this, one of my favorite, like, you know. Uh, good internet speak for holy cow. And by the way, you're not a real internet sensation until you have an unboxing video. Someone who posts a video of them opening the box, right? <laughs> Apple products get that treatment. And we had this and I said, oh, we've arrived. This is fantastic. <laughs> but old and young and lots of different people showing us what they're drawing, how they set it up. Uh, you know, so they're showing us their setup and I'm like, good, that he understands the lighting on this one. And then the drawings that people are doing, some are really beautiful because they're first beginnings, very simple setup. Some more accomplished because maybe the person using it is an artist. Some are a little weird, a little strange. Um, 
Because this is not a real squirrel. This is a stuffed squirrel, a dead one, because it's not going to sit still to do the drawing. So you can imagine what he has in his house, this, this, this person. Um, but we're making more, and so you know, we're going to work out how to do pre-ordering and international delivery in a better way. Uh, the, the world now is in, in such a way that makes it possible, which is really great. But given my research, this is really one of the more exciting projects. Not just because you get to try it for yourself, because we have it here in the gallery, but it is this piece of media archaeology. It's something that's 200 years old that why would anybody want this thing? It doesn't even have an on switch. It's not electronic. Who cares? But somehow people actually do want it. And so it's analog virtuality, right? It's technology in your hand. And it's ready for you to have your own adventures in virtuality. Thank you. Thank you.